掌声欢迎 Nina。Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> Wake up, everyone! <laughs> I know it's hard. It's been a long day, and this is the afternoon nap. But I'm going to make it short and crisp. And this is going to be a lot about color and looking on the positive side of things. So um, yeah, I hope you you won't fall asleep. <laughs> um, I want to talk about waste like so many others today but specifically I want to talk about the value of waste and this is also how we perceive waste and how we look at it so usually we don't like to look at it we are disgusted we find it ugly and we find because we find it ugly we also find, think it's worthless So, how do you perceive this picture? There's beautiful colors in there. It's all neatly arranged. There's a certain aesthetic all of a sudden, but you're still looking at waste. So this, these are the kind of installations I make on beaches in Hong Kong, and also recently I did one in Taiwan the first one outside of Hong Kong that was very interesting. And what you see here is all ocean debris. And what these things have in common is that they all float. Most of it is plastic, but you can also see natural objects. One moment. There's roots here. There's some, um, some shells, some pods here. So I'm combining natural as well as man-made waste. I come to, down to a beach and I use whatever I find and I rearrange it by color and I put it in an orderly way. I do not change the colors in any way. So I do not spray paint or um, color those objects. And also in this photograph, I didn't Photoshop the photograph. So these are, this is all original. The only thing that I do is rearrange what I find. So in order to make these color wheels bigger, I need art assistants. And my favorite art assistants are children and students, because the, you guys are still very open-minded, and you don't judge things, and um, you just get the idea right away. <laughs> so here you can see, I started this color wheel in the middle with a basic color sequence, and then the kids add the colors, so uh, it's a bit hard to see, but they just pick up a piece of waste and then they walk around the color wheel and very intuitively you will see the spot where it fits in and then they put it there. So this, uh, these kind of installations are uh, with an open end, I don't know how big it's going to be, it just always depends on the day and on the beach. And uh, so they grow quite organically and depending on how many kids are helping on that day. Um, you might be aware Hong Kong is located at the mouth of the Pearl River Delta. So in Hong Kong we get all of or most of the waste from, from China, from Shenzhen. Shenzhen and Guangdong is they are one of the largest industrial belts in the world. So we get 
large, I mean, amounts of waste that can't be, um, you, you can't grasp the extent of rubbish that we get on the beaches in Hong Kong. And people don't, are not aware of this fact because there's only a couple of maintained beaches that people always go to for swimming and recreational purposes. And these beaches are cleaned up every day from nine to five for seven days a week. And there's not only one person cleaning that beach, but three to five people. So you can imagine that's the amount of effort it takes to keep a beach clean in Hong Kong. And people never go to the non-maintained beaches and they never see this reality that there's actually that much rubbish from the ocean and from Hong Kong in, in, on our beaches and in our natural environment. This is the installation once it's finished. And I always take a picture in the context of nature because this is where our problem is. The problem is that the waste got out of our home, out of our society and into nature and it's uncontrolled. The name of these installations is um, Waste Mountain Water, but it comes from the Chinese uh, name. Let me try to pronounce it. Le Shi Shan Shui. <laughs> so Shan Shui, as you know, is, means landscape. And it also stands for the Chinese calligraphy that you put on your wall. That's why I always choose this very elongated format to present those pictures um, in, in a gallery or in an ex um, exhibition uh, environment. And like, you know, Shan is mountain and Shui is water. So you have these two elements. And to these two natural elements today, this reality that we live in, there's one third element added, which is waste. So this is how the name, that's why I chose the name like this. A couple of months ago, I read in an article that um, scientists or geologists were um, redefining a new, uh, a new term, which is plastiglomerates. It's plastic components. And these plastic plastiglomerates um, are defined by melted plastic. And the, there's uh, into this melted plastic, there's sand and rocks and shells, things that are heavy. And it happens because, especially in remote islands where there's no proper rubbish disposal or any um, waste management, people are just burning their waste on the beach. And then you get these rocky, um, very heavy plastic glomerates. And those plastic glomerates sink down to the bottom of the ocean. And exactly like Jason was telling us in his first slide, how will our era be defined? It will be defined like hundreds and thousands of years later by the plastic that we leave behind. Because these plastic glomerates, once they sink down to the bottom of the ocean, there's no light ever reaching them, so they don't break down anymore. Okay. Let me tell you how I started to do the um, waste mountain water installations. Um, I'm a German-born artist. I live in Hong Kong since seven years with my family. We live on Lantau Island. Lantau Island is a beautiful island. Uh, if you fly into Hong Kong, that's the island where the airport is on. So we're just on the other side of that mountain range. There's beautiful
beautiful beaches all along that coast. And every autumn, me and my family, we go camping. So for the first time that we went camping, we stayed for five days, a really long time. So it was in one of the nature reserves. <laughs> and I had a lot of time to discover the area and to look around. And this is what I found. There's a little mountain stream, or quite a big mountain stream actually, coming in to that valley. You can see the, the beach is right here. And the river comes in here. And just behind the rocks and the vegetation, you can find this. I was really shocked to see it. It was the first time that I've been to a non-maintained beach in Hong Kong. And my, my thought was, the world needs to see this. Why is no one looking at this? Why is no one talking about this? And, my, and the other thing, because I'm, I'm an artist, I'm, my background is that of a painter, is that I, all of a sudden I saw all of these colors. So, only yellows and reds and it's not it's more colorful in reality <laughs> than on this slide so i was shocked on the one hand and i was fascinated on the other hand because also all of these single each single object tells a whole story it tells about it it, it says so much about us about our society what our preferences are what we like what we don't like, why we throw things away, what's worth something to us and what's worthless. So there was also a lot of fascination. And I, because I'm, my background is that of a painter, I intuitively started to pick one color at a time. And this is the very first um, installation that I did. This is just about one meter in diagonal. And I didn't do a lot. I just arranged it by colors. But the effect is quite beautiful. And that struck me. That picture from before is so ugly. And it's the same things. It's the very same things. And this one is so beautiful. What happens here? We see one single object in nature, like a lost toothbrush or lighter, and we are repelled. We find it ugly. But then, once it's in order, once we give it purpose, once it's part of a bigger whole, our perception changes. And not only changes, but goes to the total opposite, from worthless and ugly to beautiful and worthy. So here's a, we, we, we give aesthetic value now to, to, to the very rubbish that we labeled as worthless before. And, oh God, I'm really not good <laughs> with, the, with the order of this. Okay, sorry. This is how I work. This is my color palette. I sort, as I said, I collect one color at a time. It's a very interesting process as well because you really see the world as a painter sees it. All the reds will stick out, will pop out, and then all the yellows, all the browns, all the whites, one by one. It's a nice process. And I'm also sharing this process with students, and I, I give workshops. And I call these um, workshops not beach cleanup, but I call it curating the beach. This term comes from a couple in California. They are called the Langs. I never met them before, but I'm sure I will at some point. And I find it very beautiful because Curating comes from the Latin word curare, and it means to care for. And
can to heal. And that's something that's very, yeah, that's very touching to me. Because this is what we're doing, right? This is what we're doing here. We're healing nature and we're healing ourselves. This is one big um, landscape that I did. So now, basically, I'm trying to bring these pictures, get these pictures out into the society so people will look at their own rubbish. And because they are beautiful, a lot of magazines and newspapers are actually willing to print this rubbish. And, <laughs> and that's great, because this is a way to, to uh, raise awareness for this very issue. This is the waste mountain water that I did in Taiwan this year. It's on Jalishoi Beach. It's very close to here, just half an hour on the east side. And it's a beautiful beach. And when we came down that day, as so often, we were thinking, oh, there's no rubbish here. We can't do the installation. And that, as always, there's always, sadly, enough rubbish. It's behind the rocks. It's in the undergrowth, caught underneath roots. So you will always find enough if you look closely. We found a lot of um, plastic bottles. Some of them also have bite marks in them, as we've, um, well, this is not really big enough to see. Um, but what I want to point out is this bottle that we found. It says Philippines here. Can you buy this? Is this a product you can buy in Taiwan? No. So as we heard before, this was this is has been swept over through the warm ocean currents from the Philippines. And of course, I have heard and read a lot about the gyres and that plastic accumulates and plastic soup and all of that. But to really hold a bottle in your hand and to really see it with your own eyes is a different story. And this is also why I find it tremendously important to bring down students and people to the beach. Because once you touch something, you're touched by it. You can't pull yourself out. Intellectually, you're always, there's always an escape. But once you're on the beach, first of all, you see the pollution and you see the issue. And what's very important too, you see the beauty of nature. And you fall in love with nature and you want to protect what you love. This is one of the biggest installations I've done so far. This is with Plastic Free Seas, a collaboration. This was Earth Day 2013. We were about 70 volunteers. And this is what we collected on a single day, on a single beach. The beach was clean before I should have taken a picture. We, everything we found was found, oops, sorry, was found here in this strip of vegetation and rocks. So you can see the enormous amount of styrofoam, plastic bottles, darker pieces of styrofoam that have, have been laying underneath the lighter parts. Um, sometimes knee deep you are wading knee deep in those styrofoam accumulations. Then here's the natural section with roots. And then here's tires, a lot of construction pipes. That's a piece of a boat. 
So if you have ever been to a beach cleanup, you know, you find anything from refrigerators to surfboards to syringes, anything you can, anything that floats. So, and this is the final picture that I did. And I didn't even include the blacks, the browns, and the whites that I just showed you before. This is just the colorful part. This is a very different approach. The pieces that I showed you so far is all on the beach and there's only a limited amount of people who will see it. Because as I said before, I'm only picking out the beaches that, I'm, that are not maintained. So I can, because there's more um, rubbish there. And the way that I spread the pictures is via, via social media. But in this case, I was asked to do an installation in town for a weekend. It is called Micro Galleries, and it's a street art exhibition that's on in Soho for um, one weekend in November last year. And I was choosing this site with a drainage. Here you can see the drainage coming down from the hill. And before I, I did this installation, three weeks in advance, I was asking people via social media again, Facebook predominantly, to collect bottle caps for me in their daily lives. And also we did beach cleanups and collected a lot of bottle caps there. And I got a huge bag from Dana and Tracy. <laughs> and so then I, poured all of these bottle caps into the drainage and sorted them by color again. And it made this really beautiful and at the same time very ugly um, uh, installation or picture. So it is so tremendously ugly because this is actually what's happening to our bottle caps when we throw them away. They will, in, in Hong Kong, the drainage is not really um, cut off or filtered from the ocean. And once it rains, those bottle caps will all go into the straight into the ocean. And this is a good way to make people in the city realize that their impact and their actions, or that their actions, have a huge impact on the environment, and that their ignorance, that, we, that they have to really get rid of, or we, I'm, I don't want to talk about they, but we really have to um, get rid of our ignorance uh, with plastic. So I'm just going to show you a couple of more pictures where I integrated the uh, environment and what what I found on site. So there was a, this is actually a tree. It's a very, you can't see the leaves, and it's a very young tree. But it is nice as an as an artist when you come to a site and you don't, oh, and you don't really know what what you find and then go with what you find. This is again students helping me making this installation around that um, tree. This is a creeper called Chinese Morning Glory. Maybe some of you know it. And I was following the branch of that um, creeper. The final waste mountain water installation looks like this. These are microplastics. There's times in Hong Kong when a lot of microplastic gets washed ashore. And these are the hands of my five-year-old son, so you can about see the size of those pieces. And this is the artwork that I did from that. It's called Broken Dreams Number One. So this is something that you can actually put on your wall. It's a painting. 
not an oil painting, a plastic painting. It will last for a long time. <laughs> this is how my desk looks when I work on this. It's quite intriguing because you, I get like a detective. So this is a clothes pack, pack. This is a lollipop. Um, yeah, the lollipop thingy. Little um, uh, rubbers. Yeah, all kinds of things that you, you will find out what they are actually. But what I, so this is the most important thing that I want to talk about. So I need like five more minutes. <laughs> um, this is a hawker stall. I called it Lost and Found. In Hong Kong, people are used to these stalls in green color. You can find them anywhere in town. And they sell anything from food to goldfish to umbrellas. So people approach this stall in a kind of shopping attitude, I would say. They expect that they can buy something. They come closer and their perception is kind of challenged because they see it's, is it vintage? They are puzzled. They come even closer and they read the labels. It's not numbers in dollars, but it's responsibility or awareness. There's also natural objects like driftwood and um, corals. Those say protect or respect. And because I always have the feeling in in Hong Kong that people are so remote from the, the pictures that I show them from my artwork, they don't really connect that this is us, this is what we are doing, this is our tribe, this is what our society is doing. I'm involved in this, I'm, it's my fault. So I'm asking people to choose anything from that shop so they can actually buy something. And in exchange, I want a statement from them. What, what, what does this word, responsibility, in combination with a plastic bottle mean to you? What does awareness in combination with a packaging for sweets mean to you? What does wonder and driftwood, what does that mean to you? And I was really touched. I got poems, I got drawings. It was really nice to see that people do connect and that they do connect the dots back to themselves. So now I want to talk, um, I want to go back to my very first um, introduction about value and the value that we give to things. So for example, that flip-flop. This flip-flop that I found on the beach, if you had another one of those, they are, pretty, they are pretty okay still. You could wear them. So let's go through the lifespan of a flip-flop and the value we give to that object. So a flip-flop at some point is designed by someone, then it goes into manufacturing, and then it's advertised. At that point, where we get the advertisement, we desire this object and the value thus is very high. So the value we give to it is really high. Because we desire it, we buy it. So once we buy it, we try it on, maybe we, st of course we still like it, but after a while we see that all the promises that the advertisement made were maybe not true. Um, it, was really not that comfortable as they told us, told us or not. You know, my legs didn't look as good as they said they would. So after that time goes by, the value slowly decreases down to the point where we want to get rid of this object. And we do, we throw it. So then the flip-flops are next to a dustbin. It's still a pair of flip-flops. But just because someone else put them there, um, we perceive them as totally worthless. 